Okay, I'm Ann Bryce, and I want to welcome everybody to our uh, our monthly meeting of the uh, Yellow Audubon. Uh, and Ken's going to be introducing our speaker in just a second, but I wanted to remind you that if you have any questions during the meeting as you're listening to Jonathan speak, uh, put those questions in the chat feature that's down at the bottom of the screen. I, I know everybody's a Zoom expert now, so I probably don't even need to say that, but click on the chat feature and uh, uh, then at the end of the uh, of Jonathan's prepared remarks, uh, Zane, one of our board members, will gather up the remarks and, uh, and read them off to Jonathan so he doesn't have to be looking back and forth at the, the screen now. And we've been at 36 for a few minutes, so I think that uh, we'll uh, go on and start. And thank you all for tuning in. And I'm going to turn it over to Ken to introduce Jonathan. Thank you, Ann. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> uh, tonight we have uh, Jonathan Valente. Uh, he's an ecologist uh, who focuses on addressing, a, a, <clears throat> excuse me, avian con conservation and uh, management issues. Um, he is currently at, uh, I keep wanting to say University of Oregon, but Oregon State, uh, where he received his PhD. And he's going to talk to us tonight about marbled virulets. Um, and um, this is a, as he mentioned this to me earlier, a small cryptic bird. And uh, I generally had seen them as dots on pelagic trips, uh, but I, I have had opportunity to see them up close. And uh, it uh, was very exciting because I remember years ago, uh, camping in the Redwood Forest and hearing the sound at the crack of dawn and figured out eventually that it was a marble mural mat. So I, I jumped at the opportunity to invite Dr. Valente to speak with us about his work on the marble mural mat so that we all can learn a lot more about this small seabird that uh, um, requires, as far as I know, requires um, the Redwood Forest or I don't know if they have to be old growth or anything, we will find out today uh, for breeding rather than a cliff, uh, says other seabirds. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Valente. Thanks, Ken, appreciate that. Um, and let me figure out the screen sharing thing here. Give me one second. And there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so as, uh, as Ken said, I, I, we're going to be talking about the marbled merlet here this evening. I appreciate you guys all joining us to uh, talk about one of the most um, kind of iconic and cryptic species native to the Pacific Northwest and Northern California. Uh, again, my name is Jonathan Valente. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at Oregon State University. So that means that I received my PhD back in 2017, and currently I am being paid to conduct research on marbled merlet ecology on a grant um, that focuses on understanding um, breeding habitat and um, breeding ecology of this species. And we refer to this as the Oregon Marbled Merlet Project. Uh, so as the, as the name implies, most of our research takes place off the coast of Oregon but I actually live in Davis, California. My wife studies grackles down here, and some of you may have seen her talk on that a, a few months ago. So that's kind of how I got hooked up with the Yolo Audubon Society. And I would also say that the, the information that we're learning about merlets up in Oregon is going to be relevant to conservation and management of the species throughout its range, including down here in California. And also, as we go through this talk, you'll see that the, the individual birds that we are interacting with up in Oregon are not wholly independent of the ones that you can find off the California coast here. So for those who are not familiar with the species, the marbled merlet is in the auk family. They have a breeding range that extends from the Aleutian Islands in Alaska down through Monterey Bay in central California. 
They've earned a lot of fun nicknames from fishermen and loggers over the years. They've been referred to as the Australian bumblebee. And don't ask me why Australian, I don't know where that comes from, um, but I think it's a cute nickname. And they've also been referred to as fog birds and fog larks, presumably because of their tendency to fly around in the early morning uh, at low light conditions when that fog kind of sits low over the coast. So the species was first described in the late 1700s. And since then, it's kind of been puzzling um, ornithologists because, uh, so of all, the, of all the native North American species, the marbled murrelet was the last to have its nest described by scientists. And that's because for 200 years, nobody was ever able to find one. And in 1956, there was an article published in the Audubon Journal uh, referring to the marble merlet as the enigma of the Pacific for this reason. And so that's, that's kind of where the title of the talk comes from. I really like that term. Now, part of the mystery surrounding the nesting ecology of merlets, uh, so as I said, they're in the auk family. So that includes your murres, your puffins, your guillemots, auklets. So all of these species, including the marble merlet, forage on the ocean. Now, if you've ever gone to the coast and gone birding and you know, looked around for some of these species, you know that most of these auks nest in really large aggregations, these big colonies that are kind of hard to miss. So no one had ever seen a marbled merlet nesting colony. And again, this is kind of part of the mystery surrounding it. And in fact, in 1970, there was another article or a note published in the Audubon Field Notes Journal offering a $100 reward to anybody who could find and describe the first merlet nest. So I guess the ornithologists were scared, starting to get desperate at this point and offering money to anybody who could help them find a nest. And it finally happened in 1974, actually over near Big Basin Redwood State Park here in, in California, just north of Santa Cruz. A logger was climbing a redwood tree, getting ready to cut it down and cut some limbs off. And lo and behold, stumbled upon the first ever marble merlet nest that we ever found. And I don't know if this logger made his hundred dollars. I don't know if they, they handed that prize money over or not. But again, this is the first time we ever found one nearly 200 years after scientists first described the species. And to this date, it remains really difficult to find these birds on their breeding grounds. And so we know very little still about the breeding ecology of the marble merlet. So tonight I'm gonna to focus, uh, I'm gonna tell you about the research that we're doing with them. We're gonna focus on three primary questions. First, we're gonna talk a bit more about what makes marble merlet so unique and interesting and important to study. I'm gonna tell you about the incredible and laborious process that we go through to find their nests so that we can study their breeding ecology. And then I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about at a high level, what we're starting to learn about them. Um, this is an ongoing research project, uh, but I'm gonna tell you about some of, the, some of the interesting things that we've discovered so far. So let's start at the top here with what makes marble merlet so interesting to study. If you've never seen one, the breeding marbled merlet is a rather homely bird, uh, kind of dark brown on top with brown and white flecks underneath. In the winter time, they have a bit more character to them, still that black brown on top with white underparts. They are a, as Ken mentioned earlier, they're a very small bird about the size of an American robin, and they can fly really fast. Their cruising speed is around 60 to 70 miles an hour. And in fact, on radar, these birds have been clocked moving at over 100 miles an hour. So they can really hum when they get up and going. Uh, like other auks, we think they're relatively long lived, probably have a 10 to 15 year lifespan. And, and we assume they probably don't start breeding, and breeding until their second, third, fourth year of life. Uh, so a relatively slow life history strategy. And they're pursuit divers and they feed on small fish and invertebrates on the ocean. Now, when it comes time to breed, merlets head inland and they're looking for old growth forests or old forests that have some old growth components to them. And typically these birds nest within 20 miles of the coast, but we've, all, we've 
identified nests greater than 50 miles away from the coast. So they can travel quite a long ways to, to try to find nesting sites. And this is a picture taken at Cape Perpetua, which is a state park in Oregon that has a lot of, relatively speaking, has a lot of merlet nesting activity. So this is kind of what we think of as typical uh, merlet nesting habitat. Now, the reason these birds are looking for old growth forests is that they need large platform limbs on which to lay their eggs. So merlets don't actually build a nest. They're looking for large limbs like this one here that have a lot of moss or needles sitting on top of them. And then they kind of nestle out a little spot on those limbs to lay their egg and to incubate it. So um, there's an example of that here. You can see this is a picture that we took from a merlet nesting site that we found in Oregon. And again, you can see that's just this mossy covered limb and you see this spot that the merlet nestled out and they again, lay their egg on there and, and incubate it there. So that you can see, this is again, why they need those large trees because they're looking for big limbs on which they can, um, so they can support the bird and the egg. Now, once a pair has selected a nesting location, they, the female will lay a single egg and she and the male will take turns incubating it for about four weeks. So remember these, these birds, even though they're nesting in old growth forest, they still need to forage on the ocean. So what happens is the female will sit on the egg for about 24 hours and the male will go out to the ocean to forage. And then 24 hours later, he'll come back and they'll switch places and she'll go out to the ocean to forage while he sits on that egg. And throughout this talk, I'm gonna, gonna show you some clips that we have taken from video footage from recording nests on our research project. And this first one that I'm gonna show you here displays that behavior. So we have what's either the male or the female here sitting on this egg. And you can see the partner come in and I, I, I guess they're talking about it. Hey, I, I had a good meal. It's time for you to go out to the ocean and, and enjoy yours. And that's all the interaction they have. And the other bird sits down on the egg and um, the one that was there heads out to the ocean to, to do some foraging. So if all goes well, after about four weeks, that egg will hatch and we have a, a chick and the, the male and the female will brood that chick for about one to five days, keep it warm for, for just a few days. And again, I have a cute little clip of what that looks like. So you can see the adult bird there. And underneath, we've got a little baby hiding out. So probably just a couple of days old. Uh, and again, they're just sitting on that for a few days to keep it warm. After that, that short period, the parents spend very little time with the chick and they spend most of their time flying back and forth to the ocean, catching whole fish and bringing them back to the chick to feed it. And they don't skimp when they bring food back to the chick. There's no chewing up and regurgitating. They bring whole fish back. And um, sometimes it can be kind of comical to see these, to see the size of the, the chicks that the parent, or the, excuse me, the fish that the parents expect these birds to eat. So you can see this chick has taken this enormous fish. It's like the size of its body and wolfs it down head first. And mom or dad gives, gives no thought to helping them out with this. They just, just leave them with that fish. And I'm not gonna show you this entire clip. It lasts about three minutes for, <laughs> for this poor bird trying to choke that fish down, but it eventually gets it down. It has a good hearty meal. Um, after, that, uh, after that four to six week period that the parents are feeding the, the chick, um, it eventually stands up and flaps its wings. It's got its, its flight feathers now, and it jumps off that limb and presumably heads straight out to the ocean. As far as we know, there's no interaction between the parents and the chicks after it jumps off the limb and heads out. So after that, it's on its own to go live its life and um, find its own forage fish. Now we think that this nesting time period is, is kind of a critical limiting factor for in the, in the life cycle of marbled merlets. 
We think that corvids, your jays and crows and ravens are some of the primary nest predators. We've documented those birds taking both chicks and eggs off of merlet nests. Uh, but this is still something that we are trying to get a handle on. Um, on our research project, we, we recorded a red-tailed hawk come in and pull a chick off the nest. And that was the first time that a red-tailed hawk has ever been documented uh, predating a marbled merlet nest. So we've still got a lot to learn about it. Um, I spared you the video of having to watch that uh, poor marble merlet chick get taken by the by the red-tailed hawk. But um, again, important information that we're learning about the things that affect uh, populations for these birds. So by now, I hope you're starting to get a sense that the marble merlet is really a bird of two worlds. It forages on the ocean and it nests in the trees. So that means that it's uh, it can uh, it. It's threatened by anything that threatens those ocean habitats. So uh, one of the big things is climate change, which affects ocean conditions in terms of warming the oceans off the Pacific Northwest, which really impacts the food web and results in decreased foraging fish for, um, for this species. And they're also affected by things that uh, affect old growth forests. So loss of those big old trees due to fires and timber harvests can have a, a negative impact on the population as well. So this bird of two worlds is really being squeezed by factors influencing both of those worlds. And the population has been declining for about 25 years. As such, the species is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in Oregon, Washington, and California. And they are also state listed as endangered here in the state of California. Now, as you might anticipate, the, uh, the added protection status for marbled merlets can have a big impact on the way that we manage our coastal forests. So this image shows you in the 1930s and 40s, this, this orange and green area kind of up along the coast here shows you potential merlet nesting habitat. That's 80 years ago. And unfortunately, we've lost a lot of that in the last 80 years. And in fact, at this point, we're down to what we estimate to be about 775,000 acres of potential merlet nesting habitat in the state of Oregon. And there's an important conversation going on right now about whether the species should be uplisted to endangered both at the state and federal level. And making that appropriate decision requires information about the breeding habitat these birds are using and the factors limiting their population growth. At the time that we started our research project, there were only 29 active merlet nests ever found in the state of Oregon. And what that meant was that we had very little ecological information to go on to help make these important management decisions. And that led to a lot of, that, that results in a lot of you know, potential economic stability because we don't know how uh, timber and conservation is going to be managed going into the future. And that's where our Oregon Marbled Merlet Project comes from we actually received direct funding from the state legislature of Oregon to the Oregon State College of Forestry to address some of these questions related to breeding habitat, habitat selection, and factors influencing population growth for marble birds. And importantly, we're getting really strong support from both the conservation industry and from the timber groups. What, what a lot of people are looking for is, is stability and confidence in how we make decisions about the forest practices going forward. And so we've gotten a lot of, of, of buy-in from people on kind of both sides of the, of the conversation. And when I say we, I want to point out that our, our Marble Merlet science team consists of a lot of people, many of whom are much smarter than me and who have been working on this project longer than me. So I don't by any means want to take all the credit for, for what we're going to present today. There's a lot of really brilliant people that have helped us collect this information along the way. So we've talked a bit now about what makes merlets unique and interesting and important to study. And let's go into talking a little bit more about how we are trying to find more of these merlet nests so that we can understand their breeding ecology. Now to start off with, let's, let's actually back up and think a little bit about what makes their nests so difficult to find. If anybody has ever worked um, like kind of just in their backyard or worked on any kind of uh, breeding ecology project, you know, with a, let's say a territorial songbird, if you're going to try to find the nest of a warbler, 
you would probably start by listening for the male singing and you would watch it and you would look to see it kind of outline its territory for you. And then maybe you would work in that territory and be looking around for the male or the female carrying nest material back and forth to a specific location or potentially carrying food back and forth to the nestlings, right? Going back and forth to a, a spot that might be useful, cute, a useful clue for helping you find a nest. Now with marbled merlets, they don't have any territorial behaviors. They have a platform and they have the ocean and they move back and forth between them. And when they're going to their nesting platform, they're making a beeline in from the coast at 70 miles an hour. And in fact, they're, they're, they're doing that usually in really low light conditions. So early in the morning. Now picture being on the ground down here and looking up at a, a dark sky, trying to see a 70 mile an hour fastball 200, 200 feet in the air, right? It's very difficult to figure out where these birds are nesting. And that, those are some of the challenges that we're up against. So to find merlet nests, we actually start on the ocean. And in the, uh, in the spring, late April and May of each year, before merlets really get going breeding, we head out to the Oregon coast, to, to the town of Newport, and we have this research vessel that we call the Pacific Storm. And every night during those couple of months, we get out on the ocean as many times as we can, trying to catch as many merlets as we can. And I say as often as we can, because it really depends on ocean conditions, whether or not we're able to send this boat out to try to catch merlets. And a big part of the reason is this, this here in the middle of our boat, you can see as we're heading out to the ocean, we have this 14 foot Zodiac, which is an inflatable boat with a, a small outboard motor on it. And this is really the heart and soul of the Merlet catching machine. And what we do is we, we take the research vessel about a mile off the coast, and then we drop this Zodiac into the water. And we have a team, uh, this, is, this is Mike Parker and Daryl and Terrell Whitworth are the the ecologists that we partner with, they're from the California Institute of Ecosystem Studies. And I think Mike actually lives in Davis, California as well. Um, but be, among these three, they have uh, about 50 plus years of merlet catching experience. And so we're really fortunate that they have partnered with us to help us uh, gather the information on these birds. So they have a lot of experience with this, but we drop these, these three men into this 14 foot Zodiac and Mike back here steers the boat and they head from our boat into the inshore area where he cruises up and down uh, near, nearer to the shoreline looking for merlets. And Terrell here has this spotlight in his hand. And what he is doing is he's shining that spotlight on, uh, on the water looking for merlets. And when he sees one, actually, if you shine the spotlight in their eyes, Believe it or not, they don't run, they don't flee. They kind of have this deer in the headlights kind of reaction and they pause and freeze up. And Mike sends the, or, or pulls the boat upside. And then you see Daryl on the front with his salmon net and he literally dips the bird out of the water like a fish. And then they put it in one of these carrying cases. So that's the process for catching marble merlets. So we drop these, these three crazy gentlemen in a boat and we send them off into the darkness. Uh, again, we're doing this in the middle of the night. And eventually we get a, a call on the radio that, hey, we found a bird and we caught one and we're bringing it back to the boat. So they bring it back and they drop the merlet off with, on, on the research vessel and then they head out looking for more merlets. So on the boat, that's where the next phase of the, of the project starts. We, we take the, the merlet out and we first start by assessing its health. And we look for any signs that it's not doing well or stressed out. And if there's any concern whatsoever, we, we let it go immediately. But the vast majority of our birds are doing pretty good and are feisty and just kind of mad that they got pulled off the water. Um, so, so we first put a silver leg band on them so that they are uniquely identifiable if they're caught again in the future. And then we take a handful of morphometric measurements on them, weight, um, wing length, bill length, things that allow us to assess their health. 
And we also take a blood sample from these birds. And from that blood, we're able to determine sex because these birds are not dimorphic. So we can't tell from the bird in the hand if it's a male or a female. And we can tell information about its breeding condition, whether it's getting ready to breed. And we can also get some information about what it's been eating from the, uh, from the blood content. And I'm not gonna go much into what we do with the blood here today, but those are some, some, more, some more pieces of data that we're gonna have down the line to talk about. And the last step, and, and importantly, is that we put a radio transmitter on each of these birds. And this radio transmitter emits a very high frequency signal every two seconds, just a beep, beep, beep. And these birds can't hear it and we can't hear it with our, our own ears, but we can pick up that signal with a telemetry receiver. And so we put this on the birds and then we set them free so that we can track them into the future. So that's what happens at night. And the next, as the, as the night crew is rolling in off the boat, we have a, another field crew that gets up early in the morning and they are hitting the pavement on the Oregon coast, riding up and down the highway, stopping at, I think there's 40 some odd points up and down the highway, using these radio transmitters to try to pick up the signals of the birds that we've tagged. And we're doing two things in, in, in this is one, we're, we're recording the locations, we're triangulating locations of the birds to figure out what areas they're using on the water. And then second, we're trying to pick up a, a daily on off signal pattern. So remember, I told you that the males and females will rotate and spend 24 hours on the ocean and then 24 hours uh, on, uh, on land incubating the egg. So what we're looking for are, are birds whose signal we can pick up on day one, but not on day two and then on day three, but not on day four. And that's the indicator that we're using that, hey, this bird probably has a nest site and we need to go look for it inland. So the next phase is to send another technician up in an airplane. So we can't just traipse off through the woods, kind of looking up into the air, trying to find this bird. We, we send an airplane up and we send a, a radio telemetry receiver up with this technician as well. And they fly low over the forest, trying to pick up these signals from the birds that we know are heading inland. And what'll happen is you'll pick up a beat from one of these birds, and then we kind of circle the airplane around tighter and tighter, and then take a GPS point there so that we know this is a general area for where the merlet is nesting. And then I think we're up to our third field crew now, uh, something like that. Then uh, another crew of people receives that GPS point. And so they know kind of generally in the forest where that nest is located. And they hit the ground on, on foot trying to figure out uh, on a more fine scale where the nest is located. And sometimes that's easy hiking and sometimes that's not easy hiking. But um, yeah, we again, we send them out with that GPS location. and. If you've ever used a telemetry receiver, it's not easy to pinpoint the exact location from where a signal is coming from, especially if it's 200 feet up in the air. But generally, they're able to narrow it down to a group of four or five trees. And you know, now we're starting to get close. Now we're starting to get close to where this nest is located. And the last phase then, once you've got this group of trees identified, we go out early, early in the morning, day after day to that site. And we have a team stand and look up at the sky like this, look up at that dim sky, waiting and watching for that 70 mile an hour bird to come in and land at its nest. And I forget what the average is. It's something like four or five days of, of doing this is usually what it takes before we actually see the tree that the bird has, um, has landed in. And that's it, now we found a nest. <laughs> Simple, right? Um, and once we found one of those nests, we uh, climb up the, what, a tree nearby, because we don't want to climb the tree that the birds are in. We don't want to disrupt those nests. We climb up a tree nearby and we attach one of these security cameras so that we can monitor that nest 24 hours a day and keep track of what's going on there. And these cameras are really powerful. So this is a nest tree right here. And this is footage that was taken from uh, a, camera attached to a tree, I don't know what it is, 30, 40 meters away, something like that. And if you, anybody of you wants to be foolish enough to find, to try to find Waldo in here, figure out where that merlet nest is located. Um, 
you've only got a second here before this camera zooms in. Nope, I didn't press play. There we go. There you go. There it is hiding there. And you'll, you'll see the eye blinking on this bird. Uh, but that's really all that there is to brooding behavior for this species. And this male or female is just sitting there for 24 hours, kind of dozing and keeping that egg warm. Now, briefly, uh, I was telling Ken earlier, we have the Oregon Public Broadcasting uh, has a TV show that they call the Oregon Field Guide. And they came out a couple of years ago and they recorded a bunch of footage of us uh, doing, going through this process of trying to find merlet nests. And I was gonna stream some of that footage here today, but we were having some issues with the, the audio and the video being kind of choppy. So unfortunately I wasn't able to play that for you, but I would encourage you if you just go Google um, Oregon Field Guide Marbled Merlet, that the, the and there's about a 16 minute segment about our Oregon Marble Merlet project, some of the, the project goals. And again, walks you through some really incredible footage of them catching birds on the water and uh, airplane, you know, flying in the airplane and all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in this, I would encourage you to, to go check that out. So we've talked a little bit about what makes Merlets interesting to study. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about how the challenges that we've had with finding nests. So let's, again, I'm going to talk to you about at, at a really high level what we are starting to learn about these birds. So first of all, we're starting to get some really important information about how the birds use the, the, the water, uh, use the area off the coast of Oregon. So what I'm going to show you here is a video clip and you'll see a white dot moving around. And basically what this is a single bird and we took a GPS location of it on the water every single day from late May through August. And so you'll be able to see it moving around. And this bird actually did never went inland to breed. But so you can see that this guy is making some 10, 20, 30 kilometer jumps up and down the coast every day. And this is giving us some important information about the parts of the coast where merlets tend to forage. And I have a colleague who's using information from this bird and from all the other birds that we recorded to identify hotspots of where merlets are foraging. And looking at that in terms of, do they overlap with some of the marine protected areas that we have? And if not, is, can we use that information to prioritize future marine protected areas to support foraging uh, habitat for these birds? And we're learning some really shocking information about with in-season breeding movement as at a very broad scale. So this is, you know, you have Washington up here, we've got California down here, you can see the Sacramento in this area. And uh, well, this arrow here is pointing to our capture location off the coast of Oregon. So this is where we catch all the birds and put radio tags on them. And now each colored dot that you're going to see is gonna represent a single bird that had a radio tag on it that we tracked during the 2017 breeding season. And you can see at first, they're all kind of captured or, or kind of being encountered around Newport. And then shockingly, we started seeing some massive emigration from our study area all the way up to uh, the Canadian border where we couldn't take our airplane into British Columbia to, to look for how far those birds were going, all the way 350 miles south down to Santa Rosa in California. And we were really surprised by this. We, these birds should be kind of moving left and right inland to build their nests. And instead they were heading up and down the coast, extremely large distances in the middle of the breeding season. So we think that this is potentially related to ocean conditions in 2017. Uh, they were pretty poor off the coast of Oregon, which meant that there was very little forage fish for these birds. And we think that in lieu of breeding, they were taking off in search of other areas that uh, they might find better foraging opportunities. But as I said, you know, at the beginning of this talk, the, the birds that we're encountering in Oregon are obviously not wholly independent of the ones that are using the California coast. But again, we were really surprised by this. And this has important implications for the way that we monitor marble merlet populations. So the state and federal agencies have, to, have split the Pacific Northwest coast into five zones, zone one up in Washington, 
and zone five down here in California. And these zones are used as sampling units for monitoring marble murrelet populations using at sea transect surveys. So agency people will go out on a boat and they will you know, ride up and down in these zones recording all the murrelets that they see in here. And this is, and this is how we keep track of murrelet populations. This is how we track them over time. Well, again, this is our tagging area up here. And each of these yellow dots represents a location that we took on a bird during the breeding season during this time when sampling on the ocean would be going on. And what you can see is that the, this has some real implications for the way that we sample because it's very plausible that birds that you are recording in one area could be recorded a second or third time in a completely different zone. And it's possible that the birds that are born in one zone could be recorded in a different zone and, and vice versa, right? So this, we're, we're currently working with the uh, Marble Merlet population monitoring team to kind of share this information and think about how this is impacting population density estimates and if there are uh, other ways that we can improve sampling in the future. And we're learning some really shocking things about marble merlet nesting rates. So in three years, 2020 was canceled, unfortunately, due to COVID, just like everything on the planet. Um, but in over three years, we've captured and radio tagged 190 marble merlets. 7% of them attempted to nest. 7% of them went inland to try to build a nest. And again, we were shocked by this, but this is obviously uh, has some impact on the fact that merlet populations are still declining and not recovering. Very few birds are attempting to breed. Why? Um, again, we think that this is probably related to ocean conditions, and these, these are things that we're still exploring, but we think that this is possibly related to ocean conditions. For the last five or 10 years, it's been relatively bad off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, which again means low forage fish availability. And if these birds are not getting good nutrition, they're probably not going to try to take the time to fly inland, lay eggs, which are very energetically expensive, and then you know, try to keep that, that chick alive by flying back and forth if they're not in very good condition themselves. So that's one hypothesis. And we had another wacky hypothesis that, that might explain this, which was that what if it's possible that it's actually a lack of information about where to nest that is leading to these low nesting rates? And that's not gonna make sense at first, but let me try to explain it to you. So we know from a couple decades of research that other species in the off family, these colonial nesting birds, they tend to select breeding habitat based on presence of other birds. So if I'm a common murrain flying over, I'm not looking down and saying, hey, where's the good habitat? Is, is that a good rock for me? What I'm doing is I'm looking to say, where are the other common murrains? And that is the, they use that as a source of social information to indicate, hey, those people, are, those people, those birds are nesting there. That's probably a good nesting location. And this is pretty widespread across the, the auk family. Now, we started thinking, well, what, what if marble merlets or auks, is it possible that they use each other as a source of social information about where to nest? And because populations are so low, maybe that is exacerbating the problem, right? So let me, let me kind of outline that a little bit better here. If a marble merlet sitting on a nest is kind of vocalizing and other birds are flying over and hearing that and thinking to themselves, hey, that bird is nesting there, that would be a good place for me to nest. Then what happens when you have a, a forest chock full of marble merlets? The information about where to nest is very widespread. And so there's a lot of social cues about good places to nest. Now, when populations start dwindling for whatever reason, the information about the high quality areas to nest in, in this forest starts to dwindle as well. And is it possible that a lack of information about where to nest is preventing birds from selecting where to nest because populations have been declining? 
it was a wild hypothesis we had, but, but we decided to go ahead and give it a test and ask whether marbled merlets are using presence of each other as a source of, source of information about where to nest. So we set up an experiment in the Oregon Coast Range, and we identified all of the old forest out in that coast range. And then these black dots represent 28 sites that we selected that had high quality merlet nesting habitat, but where no marbled merlets had ever been detected breeding previously. So these are unoccupied, un unused sites. And then we did an experiment that took place over a couple of breeding seasons. So we're gonna use this timeline here to help us keep track of, of the course of that experiment. In the breeding season of 2016, we sent technicians out to these 28 locations and we had them set up a playback and recording device at each of those locations. And I'm gonna abbreviate playback recording device as a PRD. And these PRDs have the ability to simulate presence of marbled merlets at a site by broadcasting previously recorded vocalizations. And when they're not broadcasting merlet vocalizations, they have the ability to record and therefore detect wild merlets that might be present in the area. And we randomly split our sites into 14 playback treatment sites and 14 control sites. And at the playback treatment sites, we programmed the PRD every morning during the breeding season for two hours. This thing was programmed to broadcast a 10 second snippet of Merlet calls every 10 minutes. And in between those broadcasts, we recorded to detect whether there were any wild Merlets around. And at the control sites, we had the same PRD set up, but we did not do any call broadcasts. We only recorded for that two hour window each morning. And then we used statistical models to model the daily probability of recording a Merlet as a function of the day of the year and whether the site received that playback treatment or not. And this line here shows you the daily probability of recording a Merlet, again, over time at these control sites where there was no playback. And you can see that uh, in late June, we had a peak where about on 20% of mornings, we were recording Merlet vocalizations. These are likely prospectors flying over or, or potentially breeders in the area. But we had a lot more Merlet detections at playback treatment sites. And it peaked at uh, over 40% in late July at these sites. And our statistical models indicated that at the greatest difference, the odds of detecting a Merlet were 15 times greater at these sites where we were doing playbacks and at control sites. Now, these results might be a little sort of uh, unsatisfying in and of themselves, because there's kind of two possible explanations for what we're observing here. One, it's possible that by coincidence, we happen to have some merlets that are nesting at both treatment and control sites. And by broadcasting calls, we're eliciting a response from merlets at those treatment sites that are already nesting there. And that we're not doing that at control sites, right? So we're not actually attracting new breeders. But the alternative is that what's happening is that merlets flying over looking for a nest are hearing our calls and then coming down in to check those sites out and potentially use them for nesting themselves. Now to separate these two hypotheses, we returned the following breeding season in 2017. And we sent our research team out to conduct surveys where they are looking for signs of Merlet breeding activity at these same locations. And importantly, there's no playback going on whatsoever in 2017. And in fact, there hasn't been any playback at, at these treatment sites for 10 months. So we stopped playing Merlet calls 10 months ago and we go back almost a full year later and we're looking for signs of breeding activity. And we lost a few sites for logistical reasons, but of the ones we were able to get back to, excuse me, um, we recorded signs of Merlet nesting activity at 18% of those control sites where there was no play playback previously but it was way bigger at the playback sites. We recorded breeding activity at 67% of those uh, 
those old growth areas where we had previously simulated merlet presence. And again, our statistical models indicate that the odds of detecting breeding activity were about 10 times greater a full year later at playback sites than at control sites. So what does this mean? We take this as really strong experimental evidence that marbled merlets are keying in on one another when they select breeding habitat. That is, one bird is, you know, nests in an old growth tree and it's either seen or heard by other birds who then come along and think that must be a good place to nest. I'm going to settle down there too. We think that's the most plausible and most parsimonious explanation for our results. Uh, so again, it's possible, and, and I'm not saying this true. This is this is 100% driving marble merlet uh, population declines, but it's it's very plausible that the lack of information out in the forests right now is exacerbating population declines because birds aren't receiving that information about the good places to nest. Now, also from a conservation perspective, this has, you know, these results imply that it's probably important to, to protect large contiguous tracts of merlet nesting habitat because these birds are going to tend to want to nest in proximity to one another. And we think there's also some real potential for using this call broadcast idea to help attract merlets to high quality breeding habitat that is potentially under underutilized right now. But we want to stress, of course, that it's really important that we understand what high quality merlet habitat looks like before we, we go down that road. Because it's, you know, we don't want to be attracting these birds to what we call ecological traps, places where they think it's a good idea to nest there, but then they're not going to be successful. So last slide here, just a few take home messages from the work that we've begun with the Oregon Marble Merlet Project. Uh, we've still got several more years of funding on this, and we're going to continue to try to find more nests and get a better handle on, on things that are going on there. But we've started to understand more about nesting locations, about some of the behaviors that these birds are exhibiting around their nests and around selecting nests, uh, and getting more information about the factors that are impacting the success of those nests. We're learning that ocean conditions probably have a surprisingly large effect on whether the birds do decide to go in and attempt breeding and um, how many of them attempt to. We're seeing some really surprising information about within season movements that, help, that is helping us prioritize uh, marine reserve areas and uh, Im improve the way that we sample marble merlet populations at sea. And again, learning some really cool and exciting information about how these birds select habitat based on presence of one another um, to add to our kind of body of knowledge about, about the ecology of the species. So that was my last slide. With that, I would say thanks to uh, you all, the Yolo Audubon Society for having me here. It's been really fun to share this information with you all. Uh, funding came from, of course, you know, Oregon and the Oregon State University College of Forestry and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, if anybody is interested in learning more about our research, we have a website, uh, Oregon Mar OregonMerlet.org. And again, I will, I will leave this up here so that you can see that website. But if you want to Google Oregon Field Guide Marble Merlet, you will be able to stumble on this 16-minute this clip that is it's really cool. I highly encourage you to go to go watch it. And I wish I could have shared some of the footage with you here today, but it's it's free and available on the web for you. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions. All right. Um, just as a heads up, also, I've put the link to the video from the Oregon Field Guide in the chat. So it should take you directly to that page. Um, awesome. Thank you, Zane. Appreciate that. Yeah, of course. And then as for questions, um, first up is, do marbled merlets only breed during the breeding, once during the breeding season, or can they have like multiple clutches or broods? Uh, <laughs> I have a bad feeling that the answer to a lot of these questions is going to be, we don't know. Um, I, there is, there has been some documentation of merlets potentially re-nesting nearby if their nest fails very early on, but uh, 
My sense is, I think our sense is generally the answer is no. Once a bird has tried to build a nest and it, it doesn't go so well, they're probably not going to attempt re-nesting within that year, especially given what we've seen with how sensitive they are to, um, you know, kind of like their low nesting rates. But as I said, I think that's a lot of the answers to these questions might be we, we don't have a lot of information on that. Okay. Um... The next one says, hello, I asked this totally respectfully, but how do you know the impact or not of tagging these or other birds? I appreciate information and your commitment. Yeah, um, so that's, that's an excellent question. Um, I think that if we're being realistic, that uh, yeah, capturing a bird puts stress on it and attaching a radio transmitter puts stress on it and it adds a small amount of body weight to them, which is something that that bird has to carry around. Um, we, we work in conjunction with the Fish and Wildlife Service. They, they have reviewed all of our protocols. We make sure, I believe it's somewhere around 3%. We make sure that the bird is large enough such that the tag does not weigh more than 3% of its body weight. And there's been a lot of research that indicates that if you have uh, less than 5% of the body weight in that tag, then it really has very little effect on mortality. Um, so it's an important question. It's something that we're keeping our eye on. We don't have any signals that, um, you know, our birds are dying at a, at a much, at, at a greater rate than they would naturally. But it's, like I said, it's an important question. And it's something that we work really closely with the federal permitting agencies to make sure and, uh, yeah, and our Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee is looking over our shoulder on that too. A group of veterinarians and, and other researchers who are making sure that the protocols that we're following are not going to have any uh, major harm on birds. Interesting. Um, let's see. The next one says, are the poor ocean conditions that you mentioned related to the warm water blob that was reported in recent years? Yeah, it's, it's all kind of one and the same, right? It's the, um, it's the warming of the coastal waters that is suppressing that upwelling, cold water kind of moving up and bringing with it high quality nutrients. And then when it brings, you know, when that upwelling occurs, it brings nutrients, which uh, the phytoplankton feed on, which the zooplankton feed on, which the krill feed on and, and on up the food web, right? So yes, it's, closely related to that. And um, this, is a, uh, this is a real problem in seabird ecology right now, which is that we're seeing these massive die-offs of these birds because of changing ocean conditions. And yeah, it, it makes me worry that, you know, the, any kind of management we do in the forest could be, could be moot if we're not able to, if these birds don't have any food to forage on. But I don't want to think too negatively about that yet. Okay. Um, I was wondering how far inland these nest sites can be and if there seems to be an ideal distance from the coast for nest sites. I don't know about an ideal distance. Um, typically they're found within 20 miles of the coast and I think the record is 50, just over 50 miles. Um, <clears throat> I suspect that the answer to the question what is ideal would be as close to the water as possible where there's high quality old growth habitat, right? It, why, why travel farther than you have to? Um, so yeah, but like I said, typically, tip, almost all the nests are found within 20 miles of the coast. Interesting. Um, a lot of praise in the chat. And then um, it says, it seems like birds in the auk family respond well to social attraction interventions. Are you aware of other species in this family that might benefit from this approach? Are other conservation studies looking at this already? This is, man, this question is right in my wheelhouse. I love this question. Uh, so we, um, I'm gonna go off on a short tangent here for just a second, but uh, a couple, there, there's been some really cool research that's happened in the last 10 years with territorial breeding species. So we've known that these colonial water birds key in on each other when they select breeding habitat. But there's been some crazy research with territorial birds, uh, black-throated blue warblers, Kirtland's warblers, uh, black-cat vireos, golden-cheeked warblers, 
Um, all these spirit species that we think of as like antagonistic to one another when they are, uh, you know, they're territorial, right? They don't, they don't want to be near each other. But there's a ton of evidence now that actually it's pretty widespread across the avian community, this, this concept of conspecific attraction. And we think it has to do with that idea, particularly for migrants, that like, if you're arriving after a long journey, you want a quick, easy way to identify habitat. And a quick, easy way to do that is locating other, you know, listening for songs of other conspecifics and being like, all right, this area probably has resources for me. So we actually have a paper coming out in uh, a couple of weeks in the journal Ornithological Applications where we reviewed these data on uh, 29 species, I think, for which uh, this conspecific attraction evidence has occurred, or, or for which, which we've documented this conspecific attraction thing. And so that's, that's my long-winded answer. The short answer is yes, there's a lot of species that this seems to occur with all across the avian community. And a lot of people are starting to eyeball this as a management technique. They're doing it with expanding Kirtland warbler ranges up into Wisconsin with expanding uh, habitat for black capped vireos in Texas. So there's a lot of, oh, and Southwestern willow flycatchers, which are on the endangered species list. There's a lot of people that are starting to use this to manipulate the distributions of birds to, um, to high quality habitat. Interesting. Um, this next one's more specific to California. It says, have you heard anything about how the marbled burlets are faring in the CZU fire area uh, along the California coast, considering that a lot of Big Basin Redwood State Park burned and some of some other parks uh, might marbled merlets nest in burned areas? Um, yeah, this is this. I don't think that we know the extent of the damage to the Merlet habitat in, uh, in Big Basin Redwood State Park. So that is kind of a hot spot of Merlet nesting activity in the area and a ton of that burned. Um, so I'm not gonna sugarcoat that. I, I, I saw somebody talk about it. We had a Pacific Seabird Group meeting a couple of weeks ago. And I want to say that the estimate was something that like 60%, maybe more of the merlet habitat down there they thought had burned. And I think it depends as for whether they'll use burned forests or not. I think it, it certainly depends on how devastating that fire is. But generally, I'm going to say probably not. Uh, it's maybe I should bite my tongue on that. I, I'm, I'm no fire ecologist. So I, I I don't know if I have a great answer to that, but I think that part of that fire was pretty devastating. And I do think that it hit Big Basin Redwoods State Park pretty hard. So we could be looking at a loss of a lot of merlet habitat in that area, unfortunately. Um, that's a bummer. The next question says <laughs> climbing techniques, which I believe is in reference to like getting up to put the cameras in place in the nesting sites. So just, just more elaboration on that technique. Um, I have never been out there with them to do this. We, as I said, we pay, we pay some crazy folks to hop in that Zodiac and go catch the birds on the water. And we pay another crazy gentleman to climb the trees for us and, and put those cameras up. But I believe what they do is they effectively take a crossbow and shoot it over a limb high up in a tree and then pull the rope down the other side and then set it up so that they can pull themselves up into the tree and attach a camera up like that. Uh, again, I've never been there in person, but I think it's, it's something like that. Wow. Um, okay, this one's about marbled merlets in general. Can you talk about how and when they transition between winter plumage and breeding plumage? What months do you expect to see marbled merlets and breeding plumage? Um, this is not my area of expertise, but I would say through August and then probably in September is when they start molting out on the ocean and probably by October, November, you're going to see them in breeding plumage. I, I am not a person who's afraid to say, I don't know. 
So I, I think that uh, you should take what I just said there with a grain of salt and um, maybe, maybe look it up, but that sounds about right to me. Okay. Um, last one uh, says, I was curious about other related auklets that may nest uh, so in solitary ways, such as, uh, I think it's kitlitzes and long-billed merlets. Um, it says Wikipedia notes that both these species, like the marbled merlet, also nest inland. Is related work being done to understand these species and their similarities and differences to marbled merlets? Um, also, are there any other ox in other genus or genera? Are there any other ox in other genus or genera who nest in this way? Uh, no, it's it's limited to the, the those three merlet species, as far as I know. It's the the kitlitzes, the long bill merlet, and the marble merlet that have that that rather unique breeding strategy. I don't know much about research going on with long bill merlets. Uh, it's it's an Asiatic species, and so I'm not aware of anybody working with those. Although I do think that our those folks that we partner with in, with catching merlets. I think that they've done some work in Japan. So I suspect that must be with, with folks that are studying long bill merlets, but I don't know much about that. But there is there are some folks up in Alaska that are working with Kitlitz's merlets and trying to similarly get a better handle on population and demography of that species and using some really kind of heady modeling techniques to integrate lots of different sources of information and put that together to get a really great picture of uh, factors limiting Kitlitz's merlet population growth. And we are hoping to partner with them in the future and, and learn from them and maybe use some of those techniques to get a better handle on, uh, you know, all the limited sources of data that we have on merlet, on marble merlets, putting those together to get a better picture of the full annual cycle of the, of the species. All right, very cool. Um, that looks like all of them. You got a lot of positive remarks as well mixed in, but that looks like all the questions. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the positive remarks and I, I'm glad you all enjoyed it. And like I said, I would, I would encourage you to go check out that clip on, on Oregon Public Broadcasting. It's some really fun stuff. All right, Ken. Sorry for the dead air. I had my mute off. Um, Fantastic. Thank you, Jonathan. That was uh, very enlightening. Uh, it's a mysterious bird. And uh, I learned a lot tonight. Hopefully I can retain some of it. Uh, and I really appreciate you taking the time um, to uh, ask questions, I mean, to answer the questions in, in addition to the presentation. Thank you, Zane, for reading the questions. And I want to thank everyone else for uh, asking these questions because uh, that just kind of, uh, we got more information out of Jonathan uh, tonight to uh, help us understand uh, the challenges that his team, he and his team are facing and how they're tackling it. I really like the one where they did the control uh, with the sounds. Uh, who knew? Um, so it was very cool. Very cool. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for uh, speaking with us tonight. This was a, a ver very exciting for me. Uh, and I guess that's selfish, but uh, uh, I was very interested to hear about this bird and, and oh, to be young again. <laughs> but uh, very involved study and uh, I don't know how you manage it all with the three different teams and um, collecting the data and all the, probably get <clears throat> more questions than answers in this type of research, but I'm glad you're doing it because it's very important for the species and the information, uh, as you said, uh, will help with uh, forest management. And uh, I don't know what, like you said, or what we can do with the ocean, I don't know, but at least we could probably save some habitat, nesting habitat for them. Um, there's one last question I can see in the chat. And it is, uh, since there is a shortage, shortage of trees in the Aleutian Islands, where do they breed there? Yeah, so up in Alaska, some of these birds will actually nest on cliff sides. Um, and in fact, that's where the Kitlitz's merlets uh, predominantly nest are on uh, cliff, cliff slopes and, and cliff sides and, and slopes. So 
they will nest there. There's been a few records of ground nests a little bit further south, but typically once you get down into British Columbia, they're predominantly nesting in old growth trees. Okay, so they're in, the, in Alaska, so it's uh, a evolutionary adaptation, I would guess, to get away from the trees. And, and because of the, probably the forage is just fantastic there, I would hope, and, um, and they've learned how to live in that area. Fantastic. Okay, so that kind of brings us to an end here. And, uh, and I'm glad that we had uh, you folks join us tonight for this talk. And I'm very, very glad and, and a virtual round of applause to uh, Dr. Valente uh, for his talk and the work that his team is doing. And thank you to the folks who, for, who's uh, um, awarded the grants because they're interested in this sort of stuff and that's fantastic. So thank you all, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, I wish you all a, a, a great rest of the evening. And uh, before I let you go, uh, just want to let you mention that next month, uh, April, uh, Joe Hobbs, the manager of the Yolo uh, Bypass Wildlife Area, uh, will present a talk on the status of the wildlife area. Um, something that's uh, near and dear to the hearts of us here in Davis. Um, and uh, we look forward to that talk next month. And we'll have more information about it in our uh, April newsletter. So with that, uh, I guess I've already wished you a good night, but I'll do it again. And thank you, Jonathan, and have a safe commute <laughs> back home. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. All right, that, that long commute home for everybody. Yeah. Okay, thank great. You, thank you all. Good night.